as we continue to try our very best to deter the Houthis in the Red Sea, our very best efforts continue to get laughed at. Now then, then not only are we getting laughed at, but now we're also losing $30 million pieces of equipment because the Houthis, who we like to ridicule and talk about how backwards they are, has just shot down a, a, one of our big drones, the MQ-9 Reaper, I believe it is. And Gary, you got a picture of it right there. Yeah, the mainstay of the American military's aerial surveillance fleet, uh, which, you know, is kind of important to us to have. And so now then the same Houthis, after we've launched all these missiles and all these threats and everything, they've knocked it down again. And uh, when we, the, if we look at what they have said in response, we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, we're going to find out it's, it's making us look pretty bad. And to try and break down some of this and some of the reasons for all of these attacks continuing in the first place, because we always look at the bottom line, we have Matthew Ho, uh, the favorite of our show. Uh, Matt, welcome back to the show. Hi, Danny. Good to see you. Well, uh, it's another one of those situations to where we're going to have to talk about some things that uh, just make you shake your head about right. what are we even trying to accomplish here. And this is the latest one. Well, so as you might guess, if they knock down one of the mainstays of our aerial fleets of reconnaissance, that they're going to gloat a little bit. And it didn't take long to find no. this. <laughs> And, you know, they, they, they went on to say that this was in support uh, of the Palestinian people because it's not just out of nowhere like what people like Jack Keane love to claim and so many others that this is out of nowhere for no reason. They're just trying to shoot a bunch of stuff in the Red Sea. So we got to go after them because they're bad dudes and bad hombres and all this kind of stuff. But actually, uh, there is a reason for it. Um, and when we take actions like this, with we don't have a military strategy. We don't have a, a path to succeed so that we can even measure if these things are succeeding. This is the kind of open-ended commitment you get. And, and, and by the way, this is supposed to be, by many accounts anyway, a deterrent to the to the bad guys but uh, as CBS News even commits uh, it's not happening these latest attacks come just days after the US imposed financial sanctions on the Houthis in an attempt to dissuade them from continuing these attacks but the Houthis have already said they consider these financial sanctions a, a badge of honor a badge of honor i keep hearing that that uh, a lot of a lot of people are suggesting that not only the Houthis not deterred, but they're actually excited about this because they did. I think as you and I talked about the last time you were on, they they stood off against the Saudi Arabia and their entire air force for better part of 10 years, which they never were able to, to subdue them. I don't know why we think a few rockets are going to this time. That, that's right. I mean, it's just as we watch this, you know, we've been here before. But it's still astounding, Danny. Right? It's still so astounding that um, we're 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 seeing this occur, um, and we shouldn't be shocked by it because this feels like uh, something uh, that we've seen in the movie of uh, previously. Uh, but th this, um, <clears throat> yeah, this this notion that they're going to back down, this notion that we're going to defeat them, uh, let alone uh, just deter them, a and the fact that it's clear to even the most uh, 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 forgiving uh, of uh, the American media that this is not going to work and that they're willing to say it uh, shows just how impossible this policy is. Uh, and then what, what's even more concerning is just, just the, the, the waste of it, right? The, the waste of this moment, the, the, whether it's the loss of lives, whether it's the continuation of a conflict in Yemen, you know, going into you know, it's second decade now, uh, whether, you know, just in a different form, uh, whether it's the possibility of that conflict erupting again. I mean, just all the different things of in the moment that are, 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 are really, really difficult to, 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 to watch. But also, two, two, five, ten 10 years from now, what does this do to the American position, not just in the Middle East, 
but across the globe, as well as, you know, here at home, as we continue to throw one wasteful, uh, more, you know, as we continue to waste more in these overseas adventures that uh, at best don't work out right, but most, mostly, most often, right, are counterproductive uh, and dangerous. Matt, let me let me ask you this, because uh, on that same CBS program elsewhere, they had, uh, I believe it was the commanding admiral uh, of the fleet that's in that area that's that's conducting all these operations here. Uh, and and Nora O'Donnell asked him, you know, what what, what is this uh, the objective here? And he said, well, listen, we are degrading their capacity and we'll keep doing it to grade their capacity. Is that actually a viable possibility? Can we knock enough things out that all of a sudden they're not going to have any more missiles to get to be able to shoot? Or are they going to be able to find some anyway? How do you see that playing out? Well, if the Saudis couldn't do it in nine years, along with an Emirati uh, ground invasion, I don't see how a handful of uh, uh, surface warfare ships, uh, along with one aircraft carrier, plus some fixed wing, of course, and of course, fixed wing aircraft we have in a region flying out of Jordan, Saudi Arabia, uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, Qatar, et cetera. Um, you know, I don't see how that's going to degrade and ultimately destroy the Yemeni's ability to carry out these operations off of their coast. Again, if the Saudis and the Emiratis couldn't do it in a decade, why do we think that we could possibly do it in the span of a few months, uh, you know, when we're already so overextended? When yeah. we're right, I mean, when when the Amer it's just not just the munitions that have been overextended, but it's the actual uh, 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 manpower of the armed forces, the Navy, you know, colleague of ours, Larry Wilkerson talks about this quite a bit. The Navy doesn't even have the manpower right now to sail all of our ships, right? We don't have enough people to fit out our fleet, uh, to crew it out. Wait, 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 wait. So all these people who keep saying we don't have enough ships, we need uh, whatever, 500 ships or whatever the number right. is. We, we don't we even can, have a number. Oh, we got. We can't even man the 270 or 275 or whatever is the number we have now. So I mean, this this idea Ooh. that somehow uh, it, it, you know <clears throat> this is going to work out better than all these other uh, inept escapades have in the past. It's just you know you really have to marvel at the people we have in leadership and the fact again that the American media is willing to question it. Uh, which it itself so seldom frequently does, or at least it takes the American media a while to question it, right? <laughs> well, so usually, yeah, American media, yeah, they usually give like the anything. Questions. Yeah, exactly. A year or two, three years before they really start saying, "Okay, hey, we can't go along with this song and dance anymore because it's just is so so 180 degrees from the reality of the situation." But here, you're seeing within two months the American media saying. Uh, this isn't going to work. You know, you said it yourself. It's not going to work. Uh, you know, so the idea, though, that um, the this that we are going to bomb them into submission, you know, if anybody who's watching cares to uh, cite, remind me where that has worked before, please do, because it's never worked. And yeah. particularly against an, uh, 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 particularly against the, the an enemy that just was victorious in a decade long for you know a uh, war of, of of invasion and occupation you know so whatever sanctions you can get into the sanctions part of it which was brought up in the piece whatever economic sanctions we think we're going to throw out the yemenis that are going to somehow be more brutal than what the saudis and the Emiratis did with their blockade yeah. that lasted for again the better part of a decade where they starved to death hundreds of thousands of people we think the yemenis are just going to give up uh, because the, the U.S. Treasury Department is going to throw some sanctions at them. I mean, it's just... It's yeah, we have such a great track record with sanctions, like in Russia, where they actually got stronger. But anyway, sorry, Will. Right, you know, I'm I mean... distracted from that, but... Um, it, it, yeah, it is. It's just, uh, it's just, I think, so enraging for a, a lot of us to be watching this, seeing that the, the evidence, the, the historical record, all of our experiences, it, it, it tells us that this is not going to work. At best, it's just not going to work. That's the best that's going to happen. But more than yeah. likely, it's going to be counterproductive. More than likely, it's going to it's going to put forward some consequence that we could throw things out in the air, Danny, of, of imagine things. But most of the time, these consequences, uh, you know, that are inevitable uh, from warfare, or often th things that you can't foresee, that you can't predict, right? Yeah. So we don't even know what could come from this. 
Well, but what we, let's, we, let's we actually yeah. want to look at some things that may come from this because this is just one piece of a lot of bad strategy and tactics that we got going on that are not connected. But as we talked about at the outset of this and was actually mentioned by that uh, uh, rather animated Yemeni uh, spokesman, <laughs> that all of this is directed toward helping what they think is the Palestinians in their war with between Israel and Hamas. With Of course, there's so many Palestinians, uh, innocent Palestinians who are being killed, and there's increasing pressure from all different quarters on uh, Israel to back off of what they're doing, to start doing, you know, taking care of the civilian population. Now, right now, as we're speaking at The Hague, the International Criminal Court is actually conducting an operation or, or a, a court case right now um, that's that's uh, separate from the one that South Africa brought up a little while ago. That's trying to bring some pressure on uh, on Israel to to end their occupation. Here's here's one of the experts on site right now to talk about it. They've got five more days of uh, of uh, arguments to hear, but the vast majority of the states who are appearing over the next five days are going to be arguing in favor of an expansive answer to the advisory opinion question being put to it. By the, uh, by the General Assembly. So I'm hopeful that the court will find in the end this is an illegal occupation and order uh, Israel to end it completely, uh, immediately and unconditionally. Now, no, nobody expects that Israel is actually going to do that. They've never listened to anything else no. coming from The Hague or anywhere else for that matter. But they're trying to bring more pressure from the outside. But in case anybody did have any doubts, Netanyahu almost immediately released this statement. Now, the Israeli Prime Minister's office has reacted to the World Court's proceedings, saying Israel does not recognize the legitimacy of the discussion at the International Court of Justice in The Hague regarding the legality of the occupation, a move designed to harm Israel's right to defend itself against existential threats. But even more specifically and more pointedly on Saturday, Netanyahu said he is going to ignore any international pressure. And then he also added this. We shall not step down to the international dictates with regards to future deal with the Palestinian. I would like to reiterate and emphasize this this evening. Such a compromise should be through direct unconditional negotiations. Israel will continue denying the recognition of a Palestinian state unilaterally. How can we give recognition to such a state after the massacre of October the 7th? This would be a reward to terrorism. Citizens of Israel, we are on the path towards history. Our fighters demand this. The families of the lost ones demand this. The entire people of Israel are demanding this. Until we achieve victory, we must, we must be united. But here's the thing, Matt, you, know, you can, from a certain perspective, say, OK, because of the terrorist activity that happened against Netanyahu uh, on 10-7, you can see why he would say, well, I don't want to reward the Palestinian people for all this terrorist strike by giving them a two-state solution after what they did that. As you know better than most, that this is nothing new. And in fact, less two weeks before this terrorist strike happened, uh, Netanyahu went uh, before the United Nations. Uh, and, and the General Assembly and wanted to make this really big peace negotiation with Saudi Arabia uh, that had an interesting twist. An historic peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Such a peace will go a long way to ending the Arab-Israeli conflict. It will encourage other Arab states to normalize their relations with Israel. Now look at what happens when we make peace between Saudi Arabia and Israel. The whole Middle East changes. We tear down the walls of enmity. We bring the possibility of prosperity and peace to this entire region. So, yeah, bringing peace and prosperity to the entire region, so he says. But, um, Gary, if we can blow up that part of the map there, what do you notice is not on this map, the new Middle East? There's no Gaza. There's no West Bank. There's no Palestinian state. So, in other words, Netanyahu has, has never had any intention, whether there was a Palestinian or whether there was a terrorist strike or not, to actually allow the Palestinians to have a two-state solution. So, it doesn't matter what the, the international court uh, says. It doesn't matter what apparently the United States says, and we're going to see that in a second ago. 
Netanyahu has every intention to keep Palestinians out. And Matt, if I can bring you back in there. there. Yeah, there we go. So when you hear Netanyahu making these statements, especially in light of that he's not going to listen to the criminal court and tries to use the terrorist attack against him as justification for not, what do you hear? Well, he, he is <clears throat> asserting his uh, his and Israel's place in, in the world order. You know, I mean, as the first among uh, the appendages of the American empire, uh, Israel has a right to do these sorts of things. So he's thumbing his nose at the ICJ. He's thumbing his nose at the UN. He's thumbing his nose at anyone who would try and either uh, uh, reason with him or order him uh, using either moral or legal or even strategic arguments. Um, they are going to accomplish what they set forth to accomplish. And that is uh, the fulfillment of the Zionist mission of greater Israel. And you could see that uh, in the map he holds up uh, at the UN, where, as you said, Danny, uh, there is no West Bank, there is no East Jerusalem, there is no Gaza, it's all part of Israel. And uh, so this opportunity that they have now uh, to fulfill that, to carry that out, they're not going to get a better chance than this. They'll never get a chance like this again. And so with the backing of the United States, they know they can persevere, they can weather anything. And if it just has to end up being the United States and Israel as a like as fortress Israel, if you will, then so be it. But they will accomplish what they are setting forward to do. And the, the, the work, yeah. yeah, here's here's the one of many problems with that. Uh, now there is because of this egregious loss of civilian life, there are an increasing number of Americans that are very uncomfortable with Israel's continuing to prosecute this war and, uh, you know, and they're thumbing their nose. It's, it's starting to wear thin on a lot of Americans. And, and, and Biden figures it out because a, lot, a big chunk of his constituency, especially on the Democratic side, are the young people uh, who are in larger numbers turning against Israel because of what they're doing to the Palestinians. And so now Biden, being a politician and wanting to get reelected, is starting to, you know, have put a little bit of pushback on some of that. And I uh, believe it was on Saturday, or no, I'm sorry, it was last Friday. He tried to push back a little bit when he said this. First of all, I've had extensive conversations with the Prime Minister of Israel over the last several days, almost an hour each. And uh, I've made the case, and I feel very strongly about it, that there has to be a, uh, a temporary ceasefire to get the prisoners out, to get the hostages out. And that is underway. I'm still hopeful that that can be done. And in the meantime, uh, I don't anticipate, I'm hoping that, uh, you, that the uh, Israelis will not make any massive land invasion in the meantime. So what he's talking about there is, is in Rafa, which I, it was, number one, it, when you compare what Netanyahu said on Saturday and how emphatic he's, you know, doing all this kind of stuff. And he's, you know, obviously full of passion and energy. And then you see Biden sit there and he can barely get his sentences out. Uh, I mean, it's it's not a minor issue when you see Biden saying, well, I, I expect. And, and then he corrects himself and says, well, I hope that Netanyahu does it. So when Netanyahu sees that, what do you think he's going to do? Is he going to give in to the pressure or is he going to continue to go on? And of course, we already know the answer to that. But as this UN uh, expert here pointed out, the situation in Rafa is getting really serious. There are more than a million people crammed in Rafa. It's not intended for a million people in shelters, in random uh, sort of uh, sheeted, plastic sheeted uh, constructions. Health conditions are very worrisome. We know that uh, aid is not sufficient to get in. It's harder and harder to distribute. We also have to acknowledge the fact that the security conditions separate from military operations due to what is called self-distribution by desperate civilians, but also looting and criminalization is hampering efforts by the humanitarian community, UN and international or local NGOs to deliver assistance to the people that actually need it. You know, that it's it, we're talking something very as bad as it's been so far. If, mm -hmm. if Netanyahu continues to ignore what the president said and says, yeah, I'm going to go in there anyway, ignores what's going on there. I, I mean, it's now to the point to where there could literally start to be people starved to death. 
right. not even get hit with the bombs and whatnot. The casualties could just go through the roof. And the question's got to be, how much longer will the American people support this? Well, I, I think this is one of those things that you, you've had. So you've had this, this uh, uh, evolution in the American political system over the last 50 years that insulated the uh, uh, leaders at federal le level, but also too at state and local levels in many ways from mass popular movements, right? So uh, the anti-war effort, uh, the environmental effort, the civil rights efforts of the 60s and 70s were very successful. No, no argument about that. And what the political system did, it said, well, we can't allow those sorts of things to happen. And so we have to insulate our people with money, our, our politicians with money. And that's what it is. And I think uh, what you have in the case of the White House's calculation on uh, how uh, American domestic politics is affecting its Israel-Palestine policy is that they, the White House calculates that the loss of the Israel lobby is a much greater harm than the loss of progressive voters. So you're going to have liberal American, liberal Democrats who are going to vote for the president regardless, but progressive Democrats may not. But the White House's calculation, I believe, is that that is not a big deal as losing the Israel lobby. So the Israel lobby pulling its support from the Democratic Party and throwing it behind uh, all that behind Donald Trump, throwing it all behind uh, Bobby Kennedy, uh, perhaps a no labels uh, candidate party. Right. And, and I think that is the calculation the White House is making in terms of why it is so uh, 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 willing to disregard what members of its own party are going to are saying about this, let alone the American people as a whole. Uh, they also, too, they realize that uh, while you will have millions who will vote on this issue, tens of millions will not. So you can but, have. But, but hang on. Hang on. Let's, let's look at that for a second, because is there a winning political move here? Because if he continues to say, hey, I'm going to go with the money and the cash because that's more valuable and right. he doesn't satisfy those progressives. I mean, those progressives could vote or even not vote insufficient numbers that that could cause a, something that's already going to be a pretty close tight race that could throw it in the wrong direction. Does Biden have a winning political play here? Well, I, I think their calculation on that is that those progressive voters, uh, aside from, say, the Arab community uh, and, 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 and maybe some, uh, the, some, some progressive voters who are very committed to, uh, you know, the idea of what is happening in Gaza and the genocide, uh, that many American progressive voters, however, will also weigh other factors. And so just today I heard Donald Trump is, is considering a 16 week abortion ban. So the White House will juxtapose that. Well, like, yeah, OK, the genocide was bad. The president did everything he could. They'll, they'll make they'll do that spin. They'll make that, you know, they'll, they'll say that those those false arguments. But then they'll also juxtapose it against. But Trump would have done the same. And by the way, Trump's going to get rid. You know, Trump's going to institute a 16 week federal ban on abortion. You know, what I mean, so it, it's, it's that type of politics, that type of uh, of cynical calculations, I think, is what the White House is making, why they continue to go along with this the way they are in terms of arguing that the president is saying is really tough behind closed doors. Words matter. At the same time, you know, how many C-17s took off from Dover today full of of 2000 pound bombs going to Israel. Right. So, I mean, those so let's, take a look at that, though. let's look at the other side of that. Let, let's say that that Biden develops a spine, that he develops a conscience and he says, OK, I, politics are not. I, I just can't morally continue to turn a blind eye to this and literally let Israel with our C-17 fulls of, of supplies, uh, cause this kind of massive civilian casualties. So I'm putting strings on it. You either stop and do what we require our own military to do or no more C-17s. What would that do, do you think, uh, to, to, his, to, the, to the Israeli lobby? Are they really going to go after uh, somebody else? I mean, what would happen to that, do you think? I think you you would you would have exactly that you you would have uh, the Israeli lobby would go after the president as would a sizable portion of the president's own party. So I think you would you would then really heal clear calls to remove Joe Biden. Wait, wait, wait. As, so you, as you think the sizable percentage of Biden's own party would go against him if he stood up for the people who were being innocently killed? Absolutely, absolutely. And we just saw this uh, a week almost two weeks ago when you have 45 members of the House Democratic Caucus 
vote for Speaker Mike Johnson's $17 billion aid package to Israel. Now, they went against the White House on that. The White House said, do not vote for this $17 billion for Israel. Israel will get its money. Don't worry about that. But the president's priority is the Senate bill, which you know it has a whole bunch of reasons for why we're supporting that. Ukraine, um, excuse me, Taiwan, uh, plus also to that you get the whole border issue as well. So do not vote for this Israel bill. This is the White House's priority to vote for the Senate bill. And you have 45 Democratic House members in an election year vote against their White House in favor of a foreign country. Right. I mean, so that I mean, the, 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 the um, wow, you know, I mean, so if you look at start looking at it that way. And, you know, you're certainly looking at some of, uh, of, of, of Democratic leaders, what they've said about Israel before, their support for Israel. Uh, you, you know, you, you, the idea that they could use that as one more justification to remove Joe Biden as the nominee. I mean, there's already a, a whole bunch of justifications for that. Yeah. Uh, but right. I mean, but this would be just another one where he could lose support within his own party, within the DNC. For now, him do they, do they, even within the Democratic Party rules, do they have the power to replace, just exchange the nominee for somebody else, even though there's uh, I mean, I don't know if they're going to hold all of these elections or not. But I mean, do right. they have the ability to do that? Well, he, he would. He, they have the ability to certainly using their superdelegates to upend uh, any contest that they don't like, right? So when it comes to the time for the convention, uh, the first right, round, right, right, the the first round they're voting is if nobody has enough delegates, then the super delegates come in and the super delegates are often enough to make the difference between, uh, you know, uh, to, to move number two or number three up to the front if that's what the DNC wants to do. Uh, Democracy at its best, man, the will of the people. Or, now, see, sorry, the what, they've done, what they've done this year is that nobody is getting any delegates. Uh, there's been no effective opposition to Joe Biden. So that when it comes time for the convention, there will be nobody who has the delegates needed to win the nomination, except for Joe Biden, if he's still the nominee. But certainly the DNC can pull him as a nominee, can pull their support, and they can throw the convention into an uproar and everything else. Joe Biden is first and foremost a loyal Democratic Party. Uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. We want to talk about this stuff. I wouldn't be surprised if there is maneuvering within a DNC right now based upon Israel's uh, uh, genocide, how bad that looks, uh, how poorly Joe Biden has performed oh, in, in all measures, right? So get get <laughs> Biden, have Biden go through this genocide with Israel and then have him step down after the primaries so that there's no candidate who can claim the delegates to be the nominee. Let him get all the tar. Let him get all the tar. Then he steps and, back, steps down. Uh, because, I mean, what you had just had last week when the Her report came out, 85% of Americans say he's not fit to be president. I mean, how can you be running this for 85 percent, right? 60 percent in total said both Trump and Biden are not fit to be president. But, you know, and this when the exactly. God help us. man. God oh, help Lord. us. But but you could see where that, you know, and I don't know if that's being overly cynical or just, uh, you know, uh, uh, just uh, skeptical or fanciful on my part. But you could see how that could play out where then the nominee running against Trump is not Biden. He doesn't have all that baggage, but also for the progressive voters who may not have voted for Biden because of Gaza, Absolutely. they can say, well, hey, this person who's running, that yeah. wasn't the person who was in charge of that. That was, uh, you know, uh, that that was Biden. This is so-and-so, whoever they have, whoever they would, they would handpick. But it certainly has not made things easier. Uh, this genocide in Gaza has not made things easier for the White House in a re-election year. But, you know, the other thing, too, we have to remember is that Joe Biden is a committed Zionist, that there is no one who has received more money from the Israel lobby yeah, over their years. lifetime, it, as well as, too, is he believes in the Zionist cause. He believes in Israel. He has said for decades this line, which you hear it, and you, you say, man, don't say that ever again. Do you know how bad that sounds? But he has said it every decade since the 70s. Joe Biden has said, if Israel didn't exist, we would have had to create it. You're right. So, I mean, like this, this, his understanding of where Israel is in its relationship with the U.S. and how they fit together, I mean, makes him, uh, you know, I don't think there are any others who are more uh, Zionist in his foreign policy than Joe Biden is. 
So, I mean, part of part of what we I should, you know, uh, uh, caution with everything I said about the money in the Israel lobby with the fact that Joe Biden, uh, Anthony Blinken, uh, uh, Jake Sullivan, these are people who have a foreign policy view that is uh, that that aligns with the larger Washington view that an Israel first policy is the right policy for the United States, regardless yeah. of the consequences. Israel first is the I right I don't know, policy. man. You know, I, 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 I know it has been that way here, but I, I, I get the feeling, and I don't know if this is more wishful thinking or an actual assessment, but I get the feeling that, that t- too many Americans are starting to say, this is too far. This one thing to support is Israel's a friend, but it's another thing to turn a blind eye to just large scale civilian deaths that are avoidable that yeah. just keep coming. And you see Netanyahu just keep telling you, I don't care what the international court says. I don't care what the president says. This is what we're going to do. Because, you know, even if just from a nationalistic perspective, it's like, hang on, this is our money. These are our C-17s. Yeah. These are our bombs that we're sending over there. you got to do something that we're going to say, because otherwise, you know, it's making us look really bad, even if you don't go it for the moral reasons, because innocent people are being killed on a daily basis. But even if you did it out of cynical policy, it seems like they're going to want to step in there. Now, I'm going to change gears for you just a little bit here uh, in, the, in the last few minutes. Well, we have. I'll say just with that, I, okay, I think we said before is likely that you will have three, four, five million votes lost people not voting for Joe Biden. And that could have an effect down the ballot as well, because people don't go out to vote for the president in November. They're not going to be voting for down ballot uh, uh, races as well. So that could hurt the Democratic Party overall as well. But I think you, very likely you will see that loss of votes. It's just that the White House calculates that those lo- those lo- those losses are not worth the money we would lose. Uh, but yeah. those losses are very yeah, a tight race, Danny. You know, I mean, yeah. those three, four, five million progressive votes that are lost because of this could decide the election. And the other thing, too, is that there's not a better alternative. Certainly there's Cornell West and Jill Stein, but they don't have the recognition. They don't have the ballot access. But certainly. If, so if you want to vote on Gaza, uh, well, Trump is would be just as bad, if not worse. And so would Bobby Kennedy. So it's not like one of the one of the there, there's a, a alternative Right. Of course, there's Jill Stein and Cornell West and whoever the libertarians put up, of course. But in terms of who's going to dominate the media, uh, there's not that alternative. Yeah. And, and let, me, let me show you who is almost certainly not going to dominate and probably is not on the high list of people to replace Joe Biden with. Ordinarily, you would think, well, the vice president, that will be the next right. one in line. But let me show you something here. This is not on Israel. This is this is. But this was this weekend. Uh, this is the quality of person that you have to work with. Watch this from uh, the, the Munich Security Conference. The president and I, President Biden and I, will continue to work to secure the resources and weapons that you need to succeed. We will work to make sure Russia pays damages to Ukraine. President Zelensky, as President Joe Biden and, have, and I have made clear, we will be with you for as long as it takes. Uh, I am dying here. When you, you're sitting there with the just lost Avdivka the same day she's making right. this and all of the trends are going towards the Russian side. And you want to take that moment to say, by the way, we're going to make Russia pay reparations to you after this is over. And we're staying with you for as long as it takes. It's like there's no connection to reality at all there. No, no, it, it's it's uh, uh <clears throat> Wishful thinking, magical thinking. But I mean, I will say that they are very good at staying with the narrative, right? The, the decision was made and OK, this is our policy. Here's the narrative that supports it. Stick with it. They're very good about that. They're very good about staying on that narrative, as we just saw there. But certainly in terms of the politics of it, we were just discussing with the president. Yeah. If they had selected a competent vice president they could transition and be very easy, particularly since Joe Biden, when he ran in 2020, said, I'm just going to do this for one term. This is about defeating Trump. You know, this is about rescuing us from the coronavirus and and everything. I I really thought he was going to do that. I I I really thought that after the after the midterms that that he would announce he's not seeking reelection. I I, I thought so, too. I think is that was that's who he is. He is a loyal Democratic Party chieftain among anything else. And so maybe, hell, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll be proven right, you know, and maybe he will resign after the primaries 
you know, because he took on the brunt of, of, of this uh, uh, support for Israel. And, you know, the new person who gets selected won't be blamed for that. But, you know, certainly you know, I did. I'll just point this out. I, I actually did speak with with someone who's a Washington a uh, long time Washington insider uh, with a lot of these things that are going on at administration level. And they, they do sp speculate that, uh, or they, they claim that they've actually heard that that's part of the democratic decision-making to let Biden take all the tar, not just as Israel, but for, you know, go through the whole process with Trump and letting him be the, the guy that Trump's uh, throwing all the, the words out there. And then at the democratic convention, then he'll step down and then they can just designate somebody. They don't even have to do anything. And all this time, the Trump will have been going against the guy who's not running. And, you know, somehow they think that that would help. But I mean, that just seems really cynical to me. It doesn't sound very democratic. Uh, it doesn't sound very American, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. And, and could you roll Ukraine into that as well? So could you also, in that case, uh, if Ukraine is still standing six months from now, uh, could you roll that Ukraine into that as well and get a negotiation out of it in the war that way with a new president, uh, you know, or a new nominee? Uh, you know, I mean, it was it was similar. We've seen that with with what George Bush did in 2008, where George Bush uh, signed the SOFA uh, agreement with, with Iraq uh, to get to race basically to, to commit the United States to retreating from Iraq, to getting its troops out of Iraq, but primarily to get. Uh, uh, to get the uh, the war, the Iraq war, out of the 2008 elections, right? So that Obama, who was against the war, debating John McCain, who was very much for it, uh, it was no longer an issue because George Bush has already signed this document with the Iraqis. We're leaving in a couple of years, right? I mean, so you 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 see where this has kind of happened before, where the president takes on himself this role, th th this role of 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 ending a problem, so that his future, you know, his party's nominee isn't carrying that with them. And so maybe that's also for Iraq, for, Iraq, for Ukraine, uh, you know, a, a path where you could see the, an outlet for the Americans to get nego negotiated into that war. But we'll the way that. that they're holding, what, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, well, we'll certainly see how that plays out here. And the last thing I want to ask you, though, is is I think it was shortly after that uh, you saw Zelensky and, and Kamala Harris up there together. I think shortly after that, Zelensky uh, made his own little video, which in certain senses is, is just as detached from reality. But I, uh, I want to get your final views uh, on, on his comments here and uh, the, the future of this war. Conversation with President Biden, very important points, including about Avdivka and the need for continued principled and sufficient support for Ukraine. Meetings with congressmen, representatives of both parties, both houses of the U.S. Congress. And each such conversation clearly confirmed the key point. Ukraine alone can stop Putin and create conditions for him to be punished for all the evil he has done. Punished for all the evil he has done. That's... Uh... Again, that's not something you normally hear come out of the mouth of the guy who's getting swacked and moved to, failed in an offensive operation, didn't did anything done for a full year and just lost a major city after he fired his commander, after the people are turning against him in his own party. Seems a little odd to me. Yeah. Um, again, they stick with the narrative, right? They stick with the, with the, with, with the, the, um, uh, the decision was made. And what's best for the politics is what we will continue with. So we will persevere with our arguments of, of you know, that victory is at hand. It's just we just need more money and more time. And of course, and you saw you saw uh, Benjamin Netanyahu use the same type of, of, of wording. Right. You know, make sure you are characterizing this as a Manichaean struggle, as a struggle of good versus evil that there can be uh, no compromise, that there can be anything. The only thing that can be is absolute victory because what you're up against is something that you cannot compromise with. It is evil. And so, I mean, certainly that that their their performance in this in terms of sticking to the narrative is pretty exemplary. Uh, but, you know, by, but but again, you know, Danny, we get we, we have this conversation a lot about like the different levels of warfare. And this is, I think, why this is get this gets drummed into you as an officer in the United States military, the tactical, the operational, the strategic and the political levels, because they do supersede one another. And so even if it doesn't make sense strategically, even if it will cause you to destroy your entire nation, basically bringing this house down around you politically, it is the best thing for you. And of course, well, who is the who then are the constituents of those political decisions, 
right? It's certainly not the people of Ukraine. It's certainly not the American taxpayers, yes. right? It's certainly not the whole world for having to endure this war for two years now with all its consequences, all its costs and all its risks to go into now a third year of it without any, uh, you know, any staunch or, or realistic attempts at ending it other than just to ask for more money so we can sit, throw more men into this meat grinder, hoping that there's not a collapse of both the front line as right. well as the Ukrainian government or the Ukrainian economy or all three. You know, that's basically you're hoping for is that that doesn't happen and that somehow what? The deus ex machina at the end of this where something intervenes, something magical happens and, you know, the, the Russian threat just the Russian invasion, the Russian army just slowly ebbs away. Uh, I just, you know, I mean, maybe they're hoping for, uh, they're reaching back a hundred years and hoping that there's going to be a replay of, 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 of St. Petersburg and the, the Putin's going to abdicate and there's going to be a revolution in Russia, but you know, that's not going to happen. That's, that's not going to happen. Yeah. There was reasons why things yeah. happened in the past. They are not present today. <laughs> no. well, listen to Man, we appreciate your time coming on today and, and talking this whole uh, this uh, range of things here we threw at you there. Appreciate you. Always enjoy hearing what you have to say on these issues, and especially because these things are all continuing to unfold. We're definitely going to keep coming back and getting updates on what's happened here, both in Israel and in the war uh, in, in, uh, in Russia and even our own domestic politics. Uh, thanks for coming on today. We really appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Denny. And we will see you next time, too. We appreciate you coming and staying with us here today. Uh, all these issues are rolling around on our on our radar screens. And, you know, we're coming up on the two-year mark of this war later on this week. And I assure you we'll be having more things to say on that. Uh, so keep checking back to our channel here. We have got some great guests coming up the rest of this week. John Mearsheimer is going to be here on Wednesday. You will not want to miss that, folks. Check back in on Wednesday. I believe it's 2.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and you're going to have a great show there because he's got some great uh, comments, uh, especially given that he was right on so many things years before this war started. And, uh, and he has not missed a beat here. You'll definitely want to hear what he has to say uh, on the next, uh, you know, what happens as we enter the third year here. Thanks. Be sure to like and subscribe. We are unintimidated and uncompromised to bring you all the information you need to make sense out of your world. And we will see you next time on Daniel Davis Deep Dive.